Well, it's good to see everybody along this evening, and we're just going to bow our heads and approach the Lord and ask for his help and blessing, even tonight in our Bible study and, and prayer time. So we'll just turn to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, that we can come on another midweek into thy presence. We thank you for this Tuesday night again, Lord, where we can come as thy people and gather around your word and to hear thy precious word to our hearts tonight. And we do ask you, Lord, you'll give us help tonight, Lord, as we uh, seek, Lord, to turn to thy word. We pray, Lord, tonight it would find a resting place in our hearts. And, Lord, that you might even speak to us tonight and challenge us from your precious word. And then a little later, Lord, we ask you for your help as we turn to prayer, Lord. But again, Lord, we realize that we're living in a time when there's much need of prayer. And yet, Lord, we acknowledge even this night, Lord, that prayer is oft neglected. And we just ask you, Lord, tonight that you'll come and visit us, that you'll pour out a spirit of prayer upon our meeting tonight. We pray, Lord, that as we come away from this building this evening, we will know that we've met with thee. Uh, Lord, that is our desire tonight. We don't want to come, Lord, and just go through, as it were, the motions, Lord, and leave again. But, Lord, we would desire tonight, Lord, that we would meet here with thee. We would know your presence. We would know your speaking voice. We would know thy help. And we pray, Lord, tonight, Lord, that even as two and three are gathered together in thy name, we thank you, Lord, your word declares that you're there in the midst. And we claim that promise tonight, and we pray, Lord, that you'll be one of our number. Just think, Lord, of the work here in Tandragee tonight. We thank you for this open door. We thank you for your blessing down through the years upon the work here. And we do pray, Lord, again, Lord, as we come towards the end of a summer and we look, Lord, again towards a winter's work, we would ask you, Lord, that, Lord, you would go before us. We pray, Lord, that, Lord, even uh, as we start back into the various works in September, in thy will, we would just ask you, Lord, that you'll visit us with a revival, Lord, that you'll visit us with a move of thy spirit. We think of the work on the boys and girls and the toddlers. We think of the work of the young people, Lord, the kids out of the town, and all of the various meetings that we have here in this church. We just pray, Lord, that you will come and visit us and bless the works, Lord, we pray. We pray for each one who leads the work, Lord. We pray for, uh, Lord, a refreshing over the summer months. We pray for zeal, Lord, and for vision, and for burden, Lord, as we come back into the winter's work. Lord, that you'll do that work upon our hearts. Give us, Lord, that vision for souls, Lord, we pray. And we pray, Lord, even, Lord, that we will see great things done for thy honor and for thy glory. We just thank, Lord, for our minister tonight. We thank you for this time of holiday and, uh, Lord, recharging that he has, Lord. We pray that you'll be with him. And for Mrs. Gray and the family as well, we just pray, Lord, that they'll know thy hand upon them. And we do thank, Lord, of the services again on the Lord's day. And we pray, Lord, as the servant comes to bring thy word to us, Lord, we pray again that you'll bring him with a message from thee. And Lord, again, Lord, that you'll visit us here in this house on the Lord's day. We do thank you tonight, Lord, for answers to prayer. And Lord, even in recent days, and we praise you, Lord, that you are a God who hears and answers prayer. And we just pray tonight, Lord, as we gather here for prayer, we pray, Lord, you'll help us to hold on to the horns of the altar, and we pray, Lord, that business would be done with thee tonight, even in the place of prayer. So, Lord, we just ask you now, Lord, to meet with us, to bless us, to encourage us as your people tonight, for we pray and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to ask you to turn to uh, the book of Nehemiah this evening, and we just want to look at um, some thoughts from chapter 1 of Nehemiah. Um, Nehemiah chapter 1, and I'm just going to start reading actually from the verse 2 just to shorten the reading a little bit, okay? So, uh, Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 2. Then Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, 
When I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. And we'll just end the reading there at the end of that chapter and we'll ask just briefly again that the Lord will bless even the reading of his word to our hearts tonight. We just thank you tonight, Lord, for your precious word. We thank you for this chapter that we've read and we ask you as we turn now to it, Lord, and consider some thoughts from it. We just pray tonight that you'll give help to all of our hearts, Lord, to take thy word tonight. And Lord, we pray that you'll apply it by your spirit unto our hearts where we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I was thinking about this meeting and, and uh, reading Nehemiah and thinking about this man, he's a very interesting character. And, you know, Nehemiah was a man that God had for a particular time. And he was a very practical man. You know, there's many today, and maybe you'll hear things like, well, what our church needs is this, or what our church needs is that, or what our country needs is this or that. And it's easy to talk about what needs to be done, but how many are getting up and doing it? And that's always the problem, and it's not just a problem of today, it's been a problem uh, forever, I suppose we could use the term. But Nehemiah was a man who wanted to be doing, and he saw a problem that there was out there in Jerusalem, and we read there as, as we read in the early verses of that chapter 1, that he was distressed by the news or the report that he got. And he felt a great burden of that need on his heart. But he didn't stop there. He didn't just uh, have that self-pity or wallow in self-pity, or he didn't wring his hands at the scale of the task that was before him. He got up, and in the midst of all of that grief and that burden that he had, he took action and he did something about it. And you know, tonight, as we think about Nehemiah, there is a, a principle here because the Lord wants people who are willing to work. And that should be a mark of God's people that there is a willingness to roll up our sleeves and not just to talk about it, but to get into the work and to do the work. And sadly, in the church of God today, there are many who consider what needs to be done um, and they have an opinion of how things should be done. But when the call goes out, they want someone else to do it. In a sense, it's that old spirit of not me. Why can't someone else do it? But that's not the mark of this man, Nehemiah. And we want to look practically at, his, at some examples from him here tonight in this first chapter of this book. Now, Nehemiah, um, in his day, there was a work to be done for the Lord. And I was reading up a little bit about the history of this book and the history of that time of the children of Israel or, or the Jewish people um, around the, the history of this book. And, you know, we read that um, there was a remnant who had gone back to Jerusalem. We're told about 50,000 Jews 
had gone back to Jerusalem in 536 BC. And in 516 BC, they, these remnant rebuilt the temple. And there was a, maybe a limited or a small revival under Ezra, um, the book before Nehemiah, through that prophet. But the passage of time has gone on, and whenever we're reading about these events, this is the year 445 BC. And again, while God had been moving and the Jews had moved back to Jerusalem, and there had been this limited revival in Jerusalem, there was still so much work to be done. And it was God's work. And God had someone that he was raising up for that particular time and for that particular hour. Someone to go to that ruined city and to rebuild the walls. Those walls that brought safety and order to that city, but they were broken down. And the man that God had was Nehemiah. Now, if you read about Nehemiah, you'll find that he was um, the king's cupbearer. Now, the cupbearer, um, I remember when I was small, you thought, that's a funny job, carrying a cup around. But, you know, it was much more than that. He wasn't a butler. Or he wasn't a, a servant in that sense. Uh, a cupbearer to the king was a, someone, you know, great responsibility. He actually had authority and someone who the king would have turned to for advice and to bounce ideas off. It was a position of great influence. But the reason God turned to Nehemiah in this time when there was a need was not because of his position. The reason why God selected Nehemiah were the characteristics that we see about this man in chapter 1. And the first thing I want you to see uh, this evening was that he was a man who had a burden. If you read verses 1 to 3, you know, Nehemiah lived in a time and a place where Jerusalem was that was in a state of dereliction. It was ruined. It had been destroyed, essentially. And Nehemiah, his life story, I suppose, and the book of Nehemiah is built around the story of the rebuilding of those walls. But you know, the building of those walls didn't begin when Nehemiah or those who worked with him laid the first stone. It began here in chapter 1 when Nehemiah had a burden. The Lord burdened his heart. You can see when he got the report, you read there that he was affected by it. He wept. It affected his heart. There was something more than just listening to the news and it affecting him in his own uh, mental capacity in his head. It touched his heart. And I suppose tonight we have to ask ourselves the question. Nehemiah here heard this report. He asked a question. He received a report, an answer. And we read that he got before the Lord. He had a burden. He had a desire to see something being done. And the challenge for us tonight is, are we burdened? You know, we're living in a country that has a great gospel heritage. And sadly, as we look around us today, it, it seems that it's just being demolished. It's not even anymore being chipped away. It's almost just being broken down in front of our eyes. And I wonder tonight, does that burden us in the way that it did Nehemiah? When you read the example of this man, there's a challenge to our hearts here. How does the dereliction and the situation that we see before us today affect us? How does it burden us? He said in verse 4, When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned certain days, and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven. You see, he was affected, not just with the weeping, but we read that he mourned, and he fasted, and he prayed before the God of heaven. You see, he had a heart for God's people, and he had a heart for God's work. And in a way, just like Moses, Nehemiah chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. It didn't matter about this man's position. It didn't matter how much power that he had in the, inside that court and inside that palace. Nehemiah was a man who had a burden. And I wonder tonight, do we have a burden for God's work? We're coming into a winter's work. There's much to be done. We have seen in the last year and a half the difficulties of being able to have meetings and, and to reach out to the unsaved. 
And God's will in the winter's work, we hopefully will see those opportunities open again. Do we have a burden to go out and to reach the lost and to see that God's kingdom being built up? He was a man with a burden, but also he was a man of prayer. Yes, he had that burden and we read that he wept, but he didn't stop there. It drove him to his knees. It, it drove him to pray unto the Lord. And we have read that passage together this evening. And we see here that Nehemiah asked for God's power. You know, uh, when I was just thinking about this over the weekend, and you think about the position that Nehemiah was in and how close he was to this king, this powerful king. And I suppose, humanly speaking, the natural thing if we had been in his position, was maybe to use that position that we had to go and talk to the king and say, is there anything that you can do here? Can you use your authority? Can you use your influence to ease the burden and, and the situation in Jerusalem? That must have been a temptation for Nehemiah because he had the position and he had the ear of the king, but he didn't go to the king. We read that he went to the Lord. He went to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And we need to look for help in the right place. And the right place is not with man. The right place is with God. As we go through the passage, we find that he prayed day and night. Sometimes we struggle to pray for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. This man was in prayer day and night. He was weeping. That burden was upon his heart. We read that he fasted. You see, he was a man who gave himself to prayer. He was a man of prayer. This book of Nehemiah, if you go and read it, it's saturated in prayer. It starts with prayer. It ends with prayer. And there are quite a number of prayers recorded right throughout this book. You see, Nehemiah started here in prayer, but he also continued in prayer as his story developed and as those walls were built. Now, I was just looking at, um, and I am not a scholar by any means, so I took a bit of looking, but Actually, if you read, um, there's a verse mentioned, or a month mentioned in verse 1, Chislu. And that month equates to, in our calendar, December. And then if you look at chapter 2, verse 1, it talks about the month Nisan. Um, and that equates to April in our calendar. So if you look at that, from Nehemiah heard the report in December, we read that he prayed. And the Bible records night and day. For four months, seeking the Lord's face for that answer to prayer. Isn't that amazing? Grief, he fasted, he wept, and he prayed for four months. And when you get to chapter 2 and you read verse 2, and he came before the king, and it says, Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. You see, that burden that he was feeling for that situation for his brethren affected his physical countenance. The king could see that he was troubled. And Nehemiah, while he went on to do a great work for the Lord, he started his work here on his knees before the Lord. And you know, tonight as we come to the prayer meeting, prayer is real work. In fact, it's the most important work in preparation for doing God's work. Before we do, we need to wait before the Lord. And before here in Nehemiah, a finger was lifted to even rebuild these walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah here, I was reading, it was approximately 700 miles away from Jerusalem in that palace. But he was on his knees and he was praying and he was starting the work and he was laying the foundations in prayer. And again, the application. We're involved here in God's work in Tandragee. And in a way, we're doing the same work that Nehemiah was trying to do in Jerusalem. We're seeking to build the walls of Christ's kingdom. We're seeking to be a link in the chain as God finds and places, as he describes in 1 Peter 2 and 5, those lively stones into the walls of his kingdom. But the lesson here from Nehemiah is that we must start correctly. We must lay the foundations. And we do that by seeking the Lord in prayer for his leading and for his guidance and for his blessing upon our labors. 
And that's why prayer is the foundation of God's work, just like it was the foundation for Nehemiah's work for the Lord. You know, so often in, in church life, and we look around us and we look at our churches and we look at our country and we look at how can we influence the community around us. We don't seem to have that influence that we once did, or we don't have that influence with the unsaved, or whether it's in our homes or our families or even around us. And you know, sadly today, many churches have turned to manipulation. They try to play on emotions to influence people, but it doesn't work. And some are turning to gimmicks to try and gain interest in the community around them, but it doesn't work. There's no lasting work done because there's no foundation laid. But tonight, we must remind ourselves that there's only one method that God blesses in reaching others. And there's only one method that God uses in allowing us to be that salt that the Bible describes the believer as. Hudson Taylor, I was reading this quote over the weekend, he put it like this, it is possible to move men through God by prayer alone. And that is the foundation of our work. And as we move into a winter's work, and we think about the work here in Tandragi, and we want success, we want to see God's name being glorified. We want to see souls being saved. We want to see young people being built up. But we're only going to see it through prayer. That is the foundation of the work that we carry out in the name of the Lord here in Tandragi. And that was the foundation that Nehemiah led as he sought to rebuild these walls in Jerusalem. He was a man with a burden. He was a man of prayer. But just finally tonight, he was a man of action. He didn't only see the state or hear about the state of Jerusalem. And he didn't just make supplication to the Lord for God's power and for God's leading and guiding and influence in that situation. But he was a man who was willing to get his hands dirty. He was willing not just to pray about the work, but he had a heart to go to the work and to give of himself to be used in God's service. In his position with the king, as the cupbearer, he had security, he had comfort, he maybe had prestige or position. He was an important man. But this man's love for God was greater than all of those things that he had. You see, those possessions, those things of time, meant nothing to him. He had his eyes fixed on God's work, on God's glory. And he was willing to pay the price and to give himself to the task that he saw needed to be done. And sadly today, and we challenge our own hearts in this, there's not too many Nehemiahs. We're all experts in seeing what needs to be done um, and how it should be done and the best way that it could be done and maybe why it's being done wrong and how it could be done better. But how many of us are truly willing to give ourselves to the task? Not many. Nehemiah had a burden, but he had stickability. And he held on to the Lord in prayer. He sought the answer to his prayer. He sought to see that answer to his prayer. But as he prayed, he was willing in his heart to be the one that God would use to deliver the people in Jerusalem and to rebuild the walls and to see God's people blessed. You see, he put feet to his prayers. And he was willing to be the instrument that God would use to see his will done. You know, in the day that we live, just like in the day of Nehemiah, it's a day of challenge, great challenge. And it seems that the enemy has come in like a flood, just like it did in Nehemiah's day. Jerusalem was leveled. It was destroyed. And spiritually speaking today, in our own country, in our own town here, the walls that we have known, those walls of security, they're being toppled all around us. And the Jews in those days, just like the people of God today, seem to be no longer powerful, particularly with the community around us. But here in Nehemiah, we can see a situation that we can look at in our own day. And when we can get discouraged when we look around us, when we take our eyes off the Lord and we look at the situation around us, the wonderful thing about the story of Nehemiah is one man with a burden one man who gave himself to prayer, and one man who was willing to give of himself 
to see God's will being done, was able not just to make a difference, not just to make a difference. He saw those walls rebuilt in Jerusalem. And those Jews that had known reproach and maybe powerlessness, they got to a point where they were blessed, where they were praising the Lord for his faithfulness. One man with a burden, one man who prayed, one man who was ready to go and to do something for the Lord. I suppose tonight we don't need to make a long application. Just a few simple questions to our own hearts tonight as we close. Do we have a burden for the work of God? That's a question to our hearts. That's a question I have asked myself as I have studied this man and looked at this chapter. If we don't, and before God tonight we have to be honest, then we need to confess our coldness and we need to ask the Lord to warm us again. Because if we don't have a burden, then I would suggest tonight that we're not walking close to the Lord. And I wonder tonight as we've come to the prayer meeting, again, sometimes we can get into habit, routine, have we come tonight to get involved in prayer, to lay hold upon the Lord? This is the work that God has called every one of us to. Not every one of us will stand up and speak. Not every one of us will be a Sunday school teacher or a missionary or to go into the ministry. But there's one work God has called us all to, and that is the work of prayer. I wonder, are we faithful in prayer? And as we're coming into a winter's work, the challenge to our hearts is, are we willing to sacrifice, whether it's our time, it's our talent, or just simply our energy? Are we willing to give it in the service of the King of Kings? Just as Nehemiah did in the example that's set before us, are we willing to put feet to our prayers and to be the one that God would use to see his kingdom furthered and those walls rebuilt? I pray tonight that as we have looked at Nehemiah, we'll take those lessons. And I just don't uh, preach at you tonight. I'm taking it to my own heart as well. There's a challenge here to us, and may God's word challenge us tonight as we have looked at the, the application of this man, Nehemiah. We, um, we're going to get down to prayer. I Just a couple of uh, wee announcements, and I have scribbled stuff down, so forgive me if I'm a bit <laughs> messed up here tonight, but just remember the services on the Lord's Day. Um, we have announced that the speaker should be the Reverend Gordon Ferguson. It's possible if the, if the Reverend Ferguson's health isn't there that it'll be his son, Paul, who'll be preaching. But we just pray that um, we'll know God's blessing through his word on the Lord's Day. And obviously the singers as well in the evening, the Brown family as they come along and minister to us. I just ask you to pray this week for tomorrow night as we have the final um, we meeting for the children in the church or the children of the Sunday school. Um, and Mark and Claire, again, not only have they organized the Bible club this year, but they've also been organizing this. So they've stretched themselves well and beyond uh, what could be expected of them. Um, but just pray for that wee meeting again tomorrow night. I think I was just looking at numbers last night. We'll maybe have about 20 children or so. There's a lot of families on holiday, obviously. And then um, on top of that, then the Thursday night, we're having another short meeting to bring that to a close and then a wee fun night and a barbecue and we'll invite some of the parents along to that so again just pray that god will bless um those efforts and and particularly just pray for safety for the children and you know what it's like particularly on thursday night when there's bouncy castles and things um things can get dangerous so just pray for safety even those wee simple things that we sometimes take for granted um and then just Finally, and maybe an encouragement, and maybe some have already know this, um, but we, we had asked for prayer uh, for Morris and Brenda's daughter, Catherine, and um, Ruth had sent me a, a wee text that she had got tonight, um, and I, I can't pull it up here at the minute, but just, I suppose, summarizing, Catherine is now breathing on her own, and she's awake, and it's a, an amazing answer to prayer. And I know um, Morris and Brenda have asked that just to thank God's people here for their prayers and just to continue to pray for her, hopefully, as, as she recovers um, and she'll know that hand of God upon her in healing as well. So that's a great answer to prayer. And as we come to prayer tonight, that should encourage us um, that God does answer prayer. 
even in miraculous ways. Um, you know, you think last week this girl was on a ventilator in a coma, and yet she's breathing unaided tonight. And that's what God can do. And so may that encourage us tonight, even as we get to prayer. Um, I'm just going to ask maybe if Patty and Lavelle, if you men would just open um, our prayer time, and then we'll close shortly after nine. Thank you.